Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Elizabeth, and you are here for 2020 College Graduates with LD and ADHD and Emerging Adulthood. How can parents help? Before we get started, please make sure your cameras are off and that you are muted. This is being recorded and it'll be posted up to, um, to uh, YouTube when we're all done. You can rename yourself if you would like. I try to keep the, um, the, the names off the, uh, off the recording, but I'm still working my way around Zoom, so I apologize. Um, we do have a chat box. You can privately message me and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Tonight's experts are Dr. Karen Wilson, who's a neuropsychologist, and Dr. Crystal Lee, a clinical psychologist. They have very kindly agreed to share their expertise with us tonight. And I am your host, Elizabeth Hamlet. I'm a college learning disability specialist, and I have a great interest in young adults and how to help them make a successful transition to adulthood. So before we get started, let me see if I can successfully pull up our poll. Okay, so just this one question. I'm just interested in who is here tonight. And if you uh, don't see your, I think I made this uh, <laughs> um, poll so that you could add a, um, a category that I didn't include. And if not, go ahead and message it to me. Okay, so it looks like we have majority parents and I don't know um, if some people are also here in two capacities or maybe even three, who knows. <laughs> uh, we have parents, we've got some psychologists, counselors, social workers, got a college staff member. Uh, I have, oh, I have a transition specialist in Massachusetts, my former home state. Fantastic, okay. I'm gonna pull this down then. Oh, and show the results, here we go. So 57% parents, psychologists, college staff member. Mm. Okay, so what's that? Um, Jeffrey Jensen Arnett is a psychologist who conceptualized this idea of emerging adulthood. And when I first met uh, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Lee, we were in a conference and we were talking about emerging adulthood rather than this idea of failure to launch for some people. So I really like this reframing and in, for big three criteria, according to Jeffrey Jensen Arnett, we have accept responsibility for yourself, make independent decisions and become financially independent. That these are the three ways that students can really move into their adult lives. Whoops, so I am going to stop sh uh, sharing this and we're gonna just go to the videos now. Okay. And we're gonna start with a discussion about ADHD and LD. Um, for both of you, what is it about LD and ADHD that makes it difficult for students now young adults that are college graduates, to get through these milestones or achieve them to fully fledged adulthood. Karen, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, and when and you talk about milestones, what are you speaking of specifically? So let's just start with the ideas of financial independence and making your own decision, taking responsibility, the, the three things that Arnett you know, touched on. Yeah, well, one of the things I think about and when I think about this period of emerging adulthood, you know, it's really this prolonged period between about 18 and 25 years of age where neurodevelopment is continuing, right? So when I think about the brain development, we often think when we send students off to college, you know, their brains are fully, you know, fully actualized and that they're all ready to take on the world and, and really function as adults. But when in reality, their brains are still developing, right? And those parts mm -hmm. of the brain that are responsible for things like planning and organization, decision-making and judgment are the last parts of the brain to develop. 
So when we think about those things and those milestones, we need to have good planning and organization and decision making and exercise good judgment in order to, to meet those milestones, right? And when we think of students with learning disabilities and ADHD, often there can be a lag in the development of those brain areas that are responsible for those, what we call executive functions, as mm -hmm. much as a three year delay. And so even though we're looking at, you know, a 20 year old, a 21 year old, in terms of brain maturity, it could be three years earlier than that, right? We could be looking at an 18 year old, sometimes even a 17 year old in terms of brain development. Mm. And I think that difficulties with executive functioning can really interfere with a student being able to reach a lot of those milestones mm -hmm. in the way that we would like them to, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about things like planning and organization, they need support. And really when we think about emerging adulthood, we're talking about brain development during emerging adulthood really supports increasing independence and responsibility, which is necessary for those things. But it, it supports those things in the context of still present parental and societal support, right? Mm -hmm. And so we still want to have those things in place yeah. as students are trying to reach those milestones. And again, realizing that students with learning disabilities and ADHD have, may have more difficulty kind of navigating and reaching those milestones because of delays in the development of those areas of the brain. Mm -hmm. Crystal, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just really stressing what Karen was saying about um, the executive functioning. Because usually when we talk of, when we think about ADHD, LD and executive functioning, we're like, oh yeah, it impacts them with like very concrete ways related to organization, problem solving, those kinds of things. But what Karen is touching upon and which I definitely see with my clients is executive functioning cuts across everything. It affects everything, like globally. It's not just affecting executive functions. All the skills that we learn are built upon having strong executive functions and the executive function is just kind of um, like you think of them as like tendrils, they reach into everything mm -hmm. that we do. So as we have these emerging adults transitioning to adulthood, you know, if they have these weaker executive functioning, it's going to delay and maybe make it a little more difficult for them to learn some of those concrete skills they need in order to transition. So exactly what Karen was saying related to needing to have those supports, um, especially with individuals with ADHD and LD, I think you need to be a little more intentional about how you're guiding them and supporting them through emerging adulthood. With a neurotypical emerging adult, you know, you can kind of throw them into the waters, not always, but sometimes, you know, like throw them in and they'll kind of get it. They'll learn through osmosis and trial and error, whatever, and, you know, they'll pop out the other end kind of a fully formed adult, but with mm -hmm. um, individuals with ADHD and LD, that's really not kind of the formula for success. Mm -hmm. If you throw them into the waters, they're gonna flounder and that affects their self-esteem, it affects their you know, feelings related to self-efficacy, which could really negatively impact them even attempting to do some of these things later on. So really just keeping in mind, being really mindful and intentional about how we're supporting these individuals so we're setting them up for success. So they are able to move through that developmental stage successfully with their self-esteem and self-efficacy and intact. I would imagine that for some parents, it's, it's surprising to hear that they might still be waiting for their students to fully emerge into adulthood, given that, you know, in many cases, they've just graduated from college. And we tend to think of those milestones, right, as signifying something. Mm -hmm. So could you speak just to how is it that they could get through college, but now we're, we're still waiting for them? You know, what are the kinds of things that might be different about adulthood that were easier in college, maybe? Yeah, I think one of the things that college does really well is it provides a structure for mm -hmm. students, particularly if they are living in, you know, in dorms or in residence halls or even apartments with other students and they have a class schedule and they have a place to be, you know, their schedule is the same from semester, each semester, 
their schedule will be the same each semester. So they have a specific time to be in class. They have a schedule in terms of when they get their work done. And so the structure actually helps students, right? And what happens is when they leave the structure of a higher education academic environment, they lose that structure that really has that implicit planning and organization for them. So now instead of having a class to attend at 9 a.m., if they don't have a job, they have to figure out what are they going to do with their day, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that, again, that then we speak, we come back to decision making, right? Now they have to make a decision, an intentional decision about how they're going to spend their day. How are they going to spend their time? And decision making we know is one of those executive functioning um, areas that is impacted. And so when you lose the structure of an academic environment, it makes it more difficult for students to kind of figure out what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And typically what would happen is after students graduate, they would then move into another structure, which would be an occupation, right? A job that they would go to at a certain time, have specific tasks that they would complete in that job, and it would provide more structure for them. But now we're in a situation where students were abruptly abruptly had to return home, right? So their structure was stripped away and then they have to learn a new way of completing their semester. And they're doing it in the midst of uncertainty and a global health crisis. And you have to really tap into your own decision-making and judgment in terms of what you're going to do, what are your next steps going to be? And that is harder for them. And it's also emerging adulthood is also a really vulnerable time for emerging adults in general because they're at greater risk during that period for depression and for anxiety. And this just exacerbates that for students. And, and so that's something to be mindful as well because that can impact the well being and a student's motivation to figure out what's next, what are the next steps for me. And again, I think we have to kind of tap into that where they are emotionally, because your ability to regulate your emotions and make sense of what it is you're experiencing is also controlled by the frontal lobe and by that executive functioning system, which is being stressed this time at this time during this crisis that we find ourselves in. And I think the one of the things that we need to remember about emerging adulthood is even though like chronologically they're 20, 21, whatever, and you expect those skills to be in line with a 20 year old, 21 year old, whatever. Skills develop at different times. <laughs> so they might have amazing like time awareness, but they have really poor organizational skills. And those are the skills that need to catch up. So depending on how all those skills are developing, you might have some things that are stronger and some things that are lagging behind. And those things that are lagging behind might be affecting the areas that parents are wishing that their emerging adults were a little bit better in. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would imagine that right now, everybody's dealing with frustration. I would think, you know, a lot of these students probably as they started their senior year in fall of 2019, imagine that they were going to graduate into a job and their own apartment and I'm guessing a lot of them are back at home where they landed in you know in March and with the jobs you know situation the way it is I mean they're dealing with their own frustration and disappointment right and the parents are probably said some of them frustrated and disappointed too for on behalf of their students right Absolutely. I mean, as far as the the emerging adulthood piece of that, you know, is there is there things that parents should be saying to their students about where they are, and to make them feel better about the fact that for a lot of them, this is just a really hard time to go out and become an adult right now. Right. I think just really validating what it is you just said that this is a really difficult time. And it's difficult for a number of different reasons. There's a lot of grief associated with what is happening right now. You know, this is a time where students were planning to celebrate, you know, a new transition, right? Transitioning to adulthood out of college, maybe into a new career or a new job, a summer internship. 
and suddenly they find themselves back at home. So I think listening to what it is that they're experiencing, how they're feeling about it, and validating those, pe- those feelings that they're having is so incredibly important at this time um, because it helps them to kind of process what it is that they're feeling and then figure out what the next step is. So I think the first step is just validating those feelings and just listening to what it is that they're experiencing. I found that with a lot of my clients, they're finding solace in the fact that they aren't the only ones mm-hmm. going through this. Um, all of their you know, fellow graduated seniors are also struggling in the same way. So in that way, I think it's comforting, even though it's a horrible, horrible situation, it's comforting knowing that they're not falling behind their peers. Everyone's kind of in the same boat, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. but absolutely what Karen was saying about you know, empathizing with that, validating how frustrating that is, um, and just being a little kinder. You know, it, it's easy for them to get frustrated with themselves, but also, you know, parents, if they're seeing their child react um, and grieve in a way that might be a little frustrating, that could exacerbate things, right? Sometimes grief comes out as irritability and anger. And as a parent, that could be really difficult to be around 24 seven if you're sheltering in place with them. Right. Are there things parents should avoid saying perhaps? (laughs) (laughs) Anything that off the top of your head, like maybe that's not what I would have said about that. Um, I don't know if there's things that they shouldn't say, but I, there are definitely things that parents can do to, su- to support students who are back at home, who've completed their college degree and are now trying to figure out what the next steps are. Um, when I think about, again, executive functioning is, you know, one of those executive functions is just task initiation, beginning a task. And sometimes that is the first thing you do in the morning. What am I going to do today? What parents don't want to do is nag and say, so what are you doing today? (laughs) You know, how are you going to spend your day? How are you going to spend your time? But I mean, opening up the discussion about, you know, so this is, you know, again, this is a difficult time. What are you thinking about? You know, what do you, what do you tap into? What do they feel passionate about? Because right now when there aren't jobs available and internships have been canceled, postponed, you know, now is a time for students to really figure out what it is that they're going to do next during this time. And parents can be really helpful in helping students figure that out. Because one of the things that's going to be very important about this time is that when the job market does open up and when careers are able to launch, when your students go on that first interview and the interviews after that first one, one of the things they're going to be asked is, what did you do during this time, right? What did you do during this time after graduation in the midst of a pandemic? And the student doesn't want to say, I watched Netflix or I made a bunch of TikTok videos, right? So thinking of helping them to figure out what to do during this time is really important and tapping it in, tapping into what it is that they feel passionate about and really helping them to think about this time as an opportunity, an opportunity to get involved in something they may not have had time to get involved in if they were starting a career. Maybe there's a social justice issue that they feel passionate about. Maybe there's a political campaign they want to volunteer and help with. Now's the time to do that, right? And so find encouraging them to tap into their their passions and also utilize the skills that they developed in college to navigate this time. Crystal, um, maybe you can take this question. How can parents help our children get motivated to job search when everything feels so much in limbo? Mm, That is a toughie. (laughs) Sorry. The the job market just really isn't what it was even a year ago, right? Like so many places are, have laid off people, have frozen hiring. There really aren't as many jobs out there. And if you think about our unemployment rates, unfortunately, there's a lot of people competing for a very, very small pool of jobs. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, I mean, I'm sounding very uh, doom and gloom right now. Mm -hmm. I think it's just important for parents to remember how much competition there is out there. Their Mm -hmm. kid might be trying really hard applying to all these jobs, but you know, because it's so competitive, they might not see the fruits of their labor. And that's really tough to see as a parent and also very tough for the emerging adult because it starts Mm -hmm. feeling a little hopeless 
So I think as what Karen was saying, like, you know, pursuing the paid positions, absolutely, because paid work is such a important part of just being financially independent and moving towards adulthood. And also maybe having that side parallel track of what are other ways you can use your talents so you're still sharp and using those skills. So once the economy, you know, starts opening up and becoming better, you're still going to be a competitive um, applicant for those jobs. Is it helpful when parents share their own previous experiences of, you know, gee, when I graduated, it was like this and I had trouble, or is that more like, you know, mom and dad, actually, I don't want to hear it. You know, is, is that, does that build any kind of, you know, communication or understanding, or is it, you know, is that maybe a place where parents should not share that stuff? That, I feel like that's such an individual person, like individual emerging adults question, because some parents have that kind of relationship with their kid already, where they've talked a lot about, you know, the parents have shared a lot about their previous experiences, and the emerging adults is very open to that. I think the one thing you don't want to get into is, I understand completely what you're going oh. through, because I also had this experience, because I don't think anyone here has had the experience of applying to jobs, having just graduated from college in the middle of a pandemic, right? That, that's a very unique and unusual situation. Um, they might have had struggles or might have applied to jobs in a, a recession or something similar, but it really is like apples and oranges. And mm -hmm. we don't want our emerging adults to feel like we're not really understanding how unique their situation mm -hmm. is. because It is very, very unique right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. All right, one of the parents has says that uh, their graduate did find a job out of state, is part-time and low-paying, but a good foot in the door, sort of like a paid internship. How do we start to move him toward financial independence without completely stressing him out? <laughs> Somebody wanna jump in? You want me to take it, Karen? <laughs> sure, you can start, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, um, for me, it's always about intentionality and baby steps. So, you know, he has a good foundation, right? He's found the job, but he probably isn't making enough to support himself. Um, so the parents being very intentional about like, okay, this is how much we're able to financially support you. This is what you are responsible for, being very, very clear about where all the boundaries are. So there isn't any mix up of like, oh, if I, spend a little too much here as an emerging adult, my parents are going to cover me because I know it can always fall back on them. I think it needs to be very clear and intentional what kind of financial support there is and when that financial support is going to start tapering off and how it's going to be tapered off, mm -hmm. like having deadlines set in place. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's a good plan. Okay. Um, so what are some other steps that they can take? So sh should parents be, you know, trying to push their kids into applying for some of the, you know, hourly jobs? Is that a good way for students to start, you know, even if it's not their dream job and not the thing they graduated, you know, expecting to do? Is, is that um, an appropriate way to start building some of those independent skills that we started by talking about. So the responsibility, the independent decision, it feels like that's not an independent decision if parents say, well, mm -hmm. if you don't have this career right now, you need to go do that. Like, mm -hmm. could it be helpful? Yeah, I think it definitely could be helpful. Um, and again, I think it really has to be individualized in terms of what the student needs. And obviously a parent wouldn't want to find that hourly job for the student and say, hey, here's a job at Burger King, they're hiring, right? And, you know, it gets, will give you something to do during the day and bring some income in. I think it really has to be a collaborative approach and to really take into consideration where the student is and what it is that th that student needs and supporting that. And for every family, it's going to be different. For some families, it's going to be important for them and the student to get an hourly job or to get some, bring some kind of, in kind of income into the household. And that may come out of need because there are parents who have lost jobs during this, during this, during this downturn 
and they need the financial support. They need their student, if they're coming back home, to help support the family in some way. And so that may be a unique need for that particular family. For other families, it might just be, they, it might be just supporting their child again in being involved in volunteer work. So again, it's providing a structure of something to do, um, something that they, connecting it to something that they feel passionate about, but also giving them the opportunity to build on those executive functioning skills and give them something to, to do and experience and experience growth and develop resilience in the midst of the situation that we're in. Yeah, I think one thing that's important to remember is getting a job and getting paid work and becoming financially independent. It's definitely a huge part of transitioning to full-fledged adulthood, but it's not the only part. So if because of the way the economy is, it's not possible to get a paid position, there are other ways, other things that the emerging adult can be doing to help prepare them for that transition to adulthood. They could be learning about, you know, balancing their books. They could be learning those cooking and cleaning skills. They could be learning how to maintain their car. You know, all those other things that come into play. They could be learning how to pay bills. You know, sit down with them, talking to them about, you know, this is how you set up utilities. <laughs> it's funny, I'm talking to clients about this actually because I, I have many clients that are moving out into an apartment for the first time ever. And they're like, I don't know how to do any of these adulting mm -hmm. things. I'm like, this is the perfect opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have nothing to do during the summertime. Um, here, are, you know, what are things that you can actually work on during this downtime because you're not working like you usually do during the summer? Like what are other ways that you can feel like you're progressing towards adulthood that doesn't involve needing to get a paid job? Right. So uh, that's a, a good question and sort of a nice lead into what I was going to ask you next. You know, for, for families where the parents don't need the student to contribute to the household income and it's just, should they have expectations for them anyway? Should there be, you know, a weekly goal for that student? Should there be, you know, should they, and you know, what would be some appropriate ones? In other words, should it just be look, you know, find a job whenever you want? And, and I ask this not be to, to judge the decisions they make, but if we're talking about students who are behind, mm -hmm. can putting some kinds of expectations on them actually help move this along? And how, what, what, what would it look like to say to the student, here's what, I'm sorry, they're not students anymore, graduate, a graduate, a young adult, what would be some ways to work on that, that, that develop their, their uh, skills? Mm -hmm. Karen? I mean, yeah, I definitely think they need goals. Sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, no, I agree. I, they definitely do need goals. And I think it should be, again, collaborative in terms of helping the student figure out what that is. And having expectations, I think, is absolutely reasonable. And again, recognizing and empathizing with the fact that this is not how you had intended for things to be during this time. Maybe they had planned to move away or to get a job or maybe they had a job lined up and all of a sudden that is no longer available. And I think recognizing and saying to the to your, your child that you know this is not how you expected things to, to be, but now we have to work out a plan for what we are going to do, our plan B. What is our plan B while you are here and while we're trying to ride out this crisis Let's plan what it is that you're going to do during this time. What skills can you develop and how can I support you in developing those skills? Yeah, absolutely. Like I think goals are very important because as we were talking about before, suddenly there's no structure, right? Mm -hmm. So in the absence of a goal, what is the emerging adult going to right. do? Probably nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's nothing to, to aim towards, like, how are they going to self-structure their time? Um, because if there's nothing to work towards, then it's like, well, I guess I could do things to be, you know, make sure I'm not bored, but you know, it doesn't really help move them forward and right. becoming uh, more adult-like. Right, and it's not intentional either. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. So we have a question, how do you deal with a student who feels that a job flipping burgers or something similar, let's say an hourly, is beneath them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, <laughs> it's, 
that problem of like, I have a, you know, bachelor's in XYZ and why am I a barista at Starbucks question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it can be helpful sometimes to focus not on like what the job is, but what the job, like what is the job for? Like is oh, it that's an interesting one. learn the soft skills that you need to learn? So when you move into your real next job, that you're going to have all these skills that you didn't have before. Like, what can you get out of, you know, working at a Burger King or a McDonald's or a Starbucks? There's, there's a lot you can learn, especially if they haven't had summer internships already, especially if they haven't had a paid job before. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of soft skills you can learn that translate to your first, like, real job. Right. I think that's an interesting way to frame it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that reframing is so important because again, you know, again, working at Starbucks, if your goal is to eventually start your own business, what better way than to be in another business and to see how it operates. Right. So it's really about reframing the experience. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things too, when we talk about expectations, I mean, should students if they don't have anything to do and they haven't quite found their passion or there's, you know, their, their cause that they want to work on. Um, sleep obviously is something still for young people when they are <laughs> graduating from college. Um, and many of them have come home on a college student's schedule, you know, up in the wee hours and sleeping until noon. Is, is that an okay thing for them to still be doing? You know, again, should there be an expectation for something? If there's nothing to do, if there's no job to go to, and you know we're still all supposed to be staying at home as much as possible if we're not at work, mm -hmm. you know, but should they create some kind of structure, and where should that flexibility be? Yeah, I, and I think that structure is very important. I think that having a plan for the week, each week, it doesn't have to be the same each week. You don't have to have that schedule, but having some kind of an intentional plan for what it is that you're going to do in a given week. And, you know, everyone is going to be different. For some individuals, they will be early risers and get up really early. And for others, they will get up a little bit later, but stay, you know, work late into the evening. So I think you have to have some flexibility with regard to awakenings and what time that's going to occur. If they're doing other things that's keep, that is keeping them up late into the evening, or they're connecting with someone in a different time zone and they're, they're working or doing some kind of activity, then you really have to be flexible in terms of what time they wake up in the morning. Um, but I think it's very important to, again, have some kind of a structure in terms of what it is that they're going to do and not, again, imposing what that will look like, but encouraging it, like kind of gently encouraging it and maybe even modeling what a, a, a day looks like. You know, what is, what, here's what I do in the morning. You know, I get up at, 7 a.m. and I make coffee and then I do yoga or I do some meditation and then I you know, check my email. So these are things that you're modeling adulthood for them in terms of, of what that looks like, right? And so that's a way to kind of, kind of demonstrate what a structured day would look like and then, and then help them to figure out what that would look like for them. But I think structure is, is very important. And, and structure helps with the mental health aspect as well. Mm -hmm. When there's no structure at all you know people are more prone to anxiety or depression those kinds of things so having some semblance of structure whatever structure means to them as the emerging adult i think is really important <clears throat> and the the one thing that i really want to stress or highlight is in terms of the flexibility i think if the emerging adult is reaching their goals mm -hmm. and accomplishing whatever tasks they need to accomplish each day I don't really care, you know, what their sleep schedule looks like, yes. as long as it's not getting in the way of them actually being productive mm -hmm. and accomplishing what they need to accomplish. Like right. as Karen was saying, if they are a night owl, let them be a night owl, as long as they're getting their stuff done. Mm -hmm. If they're an early riser and they want to go to bed at 9 p.m., go for it, as long as, you know, yeah. you're doing what you need to be doing. Because that's exactly what adulthood is, right? Like we, Karen, Elizabeth, myself, we all get to choose our schedules, right. but we make sure we get our stuff done mm -hmm. within whatever schedule we create for ourselves. Right. Well, and when it comes to sleep, you know, one thing is it sometimes um, a, a lot of sleep can be a sign of depression. So as our young people are moving back home and facing a historic situation, how do 
families know when it's sleeping is just sleeping, um, when you know irritability is just appropriate, and when it might be time to talk to a professional. Yeah, I think that when you start seeing that things are not getting done, where there's really an impact on their daily functioning, or you they're just not motivated to get up in the morning or motivated to get anything done, you do see that irritability, maybe some withdrawal behaviors, some things that you hadn't seen before. I think those are signs of the mood issues, either sadness or depression or anxiety, really impacting their ability to function on a daily basis. And that's when it's really time to, to seek support. Yeah, if you notice changes. So if your emerging adult usually is someone who likes to sleep 10, 11 hours, and they're still sleeping 10, 11 hours, then maybe that's not as much of a cause for concern because that's their typical behavior. But if you have someone who usually sleeps seven, eight hours, and now suddenly they're sleeping 10, 11, 12 hours, that is like a shift in behavior that you might want to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, like if their eating habits change, like they're mm -hmm. eating much less or eating a lot more, um, if their mood, you know, if they're usually a more quiet, solemn person and they're still quiet and solemn, maybe that's not like an issue mm -hmm. to be concerned about. But if they're usually, very talkative and very social with the family and they slowly are becoming less social and less talkative, then that might be a, a reason to be a little worried. So one way to, um, and this is a great question, so one way to create structure and place expectations and get them involved is chores around the house. <laughs> so we specifically have a question that says when our child was in school, we didn't require much in the way of chores because we didn't want to take time away from school. How do we now say, hey, we really need you to help around the house? Right. Um, I, I think I would probably stay away from the word chores. Brings up being, you know, 15 years old and having to take out the trash. I would say, you know, we're all going to support this household and we all have different responsibilities. And, and again, what are some things do, and you want them to be work out of their areas of strength, right? If they, they can't mow the lawn, then maybe that shouldn't be their thing, right? Um, and so what are some things that you can think of that you can do to help us around the house and really involve them in the dialogue? Here's some things that I do. And these are some things that, you know, your significant other does. And these are some things that, that are typically need to get done on a weekly basis. Where do you think you can, you can help us as a family? So I think that's another way of, of, of getting the emerging adult on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to frame it as how are you going to contribute to the household? Mm -hmm. How are you going to be a, a good household member? Because everyone contributes in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and usually we don't even think about it like, you know, I just do the dishes. because That's just what I do. But mm -hmm. th that's a way that we contribute to the household. Right. Taking out trash is a way of contributing to the household. Doing people's laundry. You know, there are so mm -hmm. many ways that you can contribute to the household. I think, um, as Karen was saying, you kind of lay it out and let them pick what are the ways you want to contribute to the household where you have strengths in those areas. Yes. Um, that'll make it that much easier, especially if they're not contributing financially, like paying a little bit of rent because they're not working, whatever. They, there needs to be some kind of buy-in into the household. Right. And I would think too, with emerging adulthoods with, um, emerging adults, sorry, with executive functioning issues, you know, you may have to maybe do things that you wouldn't have expected to do for a young person, of, you know, late, mm -hmm. uh, late teens, early 20s. I mean, can you speak to how to support executive functioning through contributing to the household? <laughs> Right. And I mean, initially they may need reminders, you know, reminders of what they agreed to. And, and that's okay. Because again, they're in a new kind of a semi new environment and with new structure and new rules and they're figuring it out. So, you know, giving them some grace in terms of figuring out what their role is in the family and how they will be contributing is going to be helpful. And so, you know, again, when they're choosing and, and they're selecting kind of what their contributions will be, you want to really frame it as something and couch it in the, 
pick something and help them pick something that again is in their strength. So if they're again a night owl and they, they're not getting up in the morning, then making breakfast for the family is not going to be reasonable. So you have to really kind of help them connect those pieces together because it could be a good idea but then also reminding them that, well, you're really a night owl and you're usually not up in the morning and I usually get up at 7 a.m. and that's what time I have breakfast. So maybe that's not the best thing. Can you think of something else you can do to help? So I think sometimes they will may not be able to connect those dots and you may have to do that for them and help them along. And then they might say, okay, well, maybe that's, that's not the best thing. Maybe I'll make dinner instead. So those are the things I think parents can do to help their emerging adults. And a, a point about reminders, um, I think the, the less verbal reminding you do, the, the better, because it, it tends to come off as nagging. I think um, a way that you can help your emerging adult develop those executive functioning skills is to ask them like, okay, they forget the first time. So ask them in a very non-judgmental, problem-solving kind of way, like, what can we do to help you remember this? Mm -hmm. And have them brainstorm like, oh, maybe I could put a cell phone reminder. Maybe I could put a checklist up for myself. The last thing you want to do is say like, I'm going to make you a checklist. <laughs> and right. I'm going to remind right. you that there is a checklist every time you forget there's a checklist <laughs> because that is really going to cause a lot of tension. And also it doesn't make your emerging adult feel any more adult-like. It makes them feel like a child. So when you engage in that problem solving with them and say the, the problem solving, you know, the answer they came up with doesn't work, then you go back again, like, okay, that didn't work. Where did that kind of fall apart? Like, oh, did you ignore your reminder? Was it not loud enough? Or, you know, like maybe you need to change the ringtone of your reminder, or, you know, like helping them problem solve those issues versus swooping in and being like, don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do that. Right. Did you do this? Did you do that? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Right, Because and that approach really empowers them and then you help them to again develop those problem solving skills that may be lacking. Well, I think too, there may be steps um, in the, our expectations for how something would get done that they're not thinking of. I think, you know, the way you clean a bathroom is one thing to one person, another thing to another. So I think all those points about, you know, making sure the expectations are clear so they don't feel maybe upset when you look at the bathroom and you think, oh, that wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, that, so, I, and I think too, sometimes because there are learning disabilities and ADHD, there may be gaps in their knowledge too. So, you know, just to make sure that they, everybody knows what the expectations are and you, you know, sometimes asking them what they think the steps should be. Mm -hmm. So you can fill in the blanks with like, yeah, that's a great start, but don't forget to mm -hmm. empty the trash cans and, you know, wipe down the blinds or whatever to, to avoid that kind of tension. So, you know, we talked about um, more serious uh, issues and worries about students' um, mental health. But what if it's just that sort of general stress and anxiety of you're out, maybe some of your friends did get the jobs that they wanted mm -hmm. and they're keeping those. Um, and, you know, for some of our students who thought perhaps that getting the degree was the ticket and that was supposed to unlock everything else. How do we help them cope with that kind of, you know, like, this was not what it was supposed to be, but it is for some of my friends because for some of them, maybe that has always been their experience of seeing other friends do things that just haven't happened for them yet. Right. Um, I think one of the things that parents can do is kind of connect it to previous experiences that their students may have had. Right. And so they may have had the same, a similar experience when they were applying to colleges. Maybe they heard back later and some people had early admission and really kind of allowing them to see the parallels that some things will happen differently for other people than they will for you and normalizing that experience. And I think that's a way to kind of help students th through it and helping them to realize that they are not the only ones who have not yet found a job. They're not the only ones who do, who lost their internship because of this situation. They're not the only ones who have returned home. And I think normalizing that, empathizing with how that feels, but then also giving some hope that this is not how things will always be. 
and we are here to support you as you were as we try and work this out and as you prepare for this next stage of your life we don't and also acknowledge the uncertainty we don't know if things are going to change next month or next year at this time and but what we do know is that we will be here to support you throughout you know whenever that transition will take place for you i think also helping the emerging adult focus or refocus back on what they can do and what ways they can progress. Um, Because oftentimes if we're stuck in this comparison game, there's always going to be someone doing better than you. Um, More so focusing on like, okay, how can you progress and how can you put yourself in a better position by the fall, that kind of thing. And, And having them reflect back on the ways they've made progress and on the ways they've really succeeded and achieved and, and all those things rather than focusing on comparing to to mm-hmm. ex, you know person abc yeah and i think that comes back to again setting goals and you know thinking about and tapping into what are your long-term goals if the goal is to become an entrepreneur what are some ways that you can learn some of those skills now during this time it might be you know signing up for webinars online and you know, taking some additional classes on entrepreneurship online or, you know, watching some YouTube videos and, and, and talks that have been given by successful entrepreneurs, downloading and listening to some podcasts and figuring out some steps, making an outline in terms of what your business will look like. So those are some things that can be done during this time, get feedback on your plan. So there are a lot of things that can be done during this time. And I think that they may, students may just need a little more support and in in really problem solving and figuring out what they can do with this time. Have you both worked with clients where the the young person, let's say the the job did hold and then they're getting ready to go, um, but the parents are looking and saying, you know, I don't know that you're really ready to move out of the house and handle paying those bills and, you know, cleaning um, and doing all that because they think, you know, back to that sort of, milestone piece of, well, I got, I got the degree and I got the job. Now I'm an adult. Um, have you, (laughs) how do you help parents who, you know, perhaps accurately think maybe their student isn't quite ready to just launch straight out and and go for it? That's a good question. I guess (laughs) if, if the parents really are accurately perceiving that their child maybe isn't ready to do certain things is getting the emerging adult the support they need to learn those certain things. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe they move out into the apartment, but they, I don't know, they can't balance their, you know, they're horrible with their finances. So Mm -hmm. getting them some kind of financial coach or financial advisor to sit down and teach them how to do those Mm -hmm. things. if, if parents are able to afford that kind of service, because I think the more parents take themselves out of the teacher role, the better your relationship is gonna be with your emerging adults. Um, mm. By the time they're 20 something, they don't wanna listen to you anymore. You know, they, they feel mm. like they're becoming an adult and that's developmentally appropriate in some ways, right? As they become more assured of themselves and more independent, they want to be. They want to have an adult and an adult relationship with you, not a, a not as much a parent child relationship with you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So if you can afford to get that outside help to help bolster those areas where your emerging adult maybe is a little weaker, then that would be mm-hmm. really helpful. Mm-hmm. And I think for a lot of parents of students who've had learning disabilities and ADHD, they have really been their advocates for so long and have helped to put a lot of things in place that have gotten them to the place where they can experience the success of graduating from college. Starting from making sure that they're getting the supports that they need in elementary and high school, they've got the assessments done, that they're getting the accommodations that they need in school and in college. So they've really played a significant role in supporting their child during all of these stages of their life. And sometimes that makes it harder to to let go because they realize that they've played such a pivotal role that they feel like they still should be playing a role and are needed to play this role of supporting their child as they transition to a new phase of their life. So sometimes it's kind of helping the parents tap into their own fears and helping them to step out of that role that they were in so 
for so long and supporting their child who was struggling with learning and processing issues. And sometimes that's where the focus needs to be. I think that's such a good point. I think, you know, I was just uh, writing something today about the fact that typically it is students who are successful have had supportive parents mm -hmm. and, you know, and supportive in the way of also making sure that they were independent enough to do things. And it is sort of, you know, I, you're never done parenting, I think, <laughs> um, but it can be hard to see the next step coming and maybe see some of the deficits and not feel like, it's time to step in and do something. So let me just put out a call again before we, because we're running out of time. If there are any more questions anybody has for these two experts here for us, it's been such an interesting conversation. I think you guys have had so many good ideas. It's, um, you know, I think, I think parents want to treat their emerging adults like adults. Um, and I think young people want to be treated like adults, but I mean, boy, when we think about the fact that the brain's not really done developing even for a few years after that, it, it does sort of throw everything into a very different light when we look at, you know, even our students who don't have LD and ADHD, sort of where they are and how much longer we probably need to wait for everything to, to finish gelling. Absolutely. So, all right, so I think we're good with that. So I'm gonna share my screen again, hopefully successfully. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so uh, for those who are professionals or those maybe with uh, their own students in different grades, um, these ladies are nice enough to come back and talk to me again in two weeks. And this time it will be on helping high school graduates in the time of COVID. Um, and that is two weeks from tonight, July, Wednesday, July 1st, 6 of, oh, I've done this backwards. Well, I'll fix it in the handouts. Um, that's supposed to be nine o'clock Eastern Daylight Time and six o'clock for my friends out there on the West Coast. So we will have a conversation about how we help our young people as they move into college. This is going to be um, a very historically different time to go to college than it has ever been, as, as these ladies yes. have said this evening. Um, we, no matter what your experience was growing up, you do not have things in common with what these students mm -hmm. are going to be dealing with in the fall. So um, please be sure to sign up for that. Um, if you are new to me, I have been doing these chats over the last couple of months um, and have covered a couple of different topics with some friends who are experts and have been nice enough to share their acknowledge and experience with me. And you can see these all on my playlist. And don't worry, I will be sending you uh, a handout tomorrow with all of this information. Um, whoops, where is that slide? Come on, let's cooperate. So there we go. Um, if you want to find these experts, they both have their own websites. Again, that'll be in the, uh, the handouts with the link to reach them. If you want to follow up, both of them have a lot of wonderful resources on their site. They've written lots of stuff. I know that Dr. Wilson has a whole uh, referral um, system that she does if you want to connect with people in her area. Um, you can find these, these experts that way. And I think if we don't have any other questions, we're gonna wrap up just in time. Ladies, thank you so much. This thank has been you. such an interesting discussion and you've had some really good ideas. I think people got a lot out of it. So I will see you in two weeks, same Absolutely. time, same station. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.